Thank you so much. Members of the families, of the residents, can we give them a hand, please? It's a very courageous thing that they're doing. That's, that's Francine. As Francine said, they formed the Family Council, which is a, um, uh, has the authority to, to uh, submit questions and get responses. They have to respond. Pacific has to respond. So it's, it's a major deal. It takes a lot of courage to do this at this particular time. But it's a huge, huge step forward. Huge forward, step forward for the movement. Thank you. Um, a good friend and one of the people that, if it wasn't for her, all this may not be happening right now. Can we have Tracy up here, Tracy Imamura for SOS. Thank you for coming out tonight. My name is Tracy Toshiyuki Imamura and I'm co-chair of SOS along with our Master of Ceremony, Mr. David Monkawa. Um, like Francine mentioned, you know, the KILA nursing home was a designated COVID facility. Um, I know that that program has uh, ended, I think effective the middle of March. Um, but we still have questions about the quality at the KILA nursing home. We want to know why does the owner operator apply for the LA County designated status? which means that they do take in COVID positive patients as overflow patients from the hospitals. And why did LA County grant them this designation when KILA had substantiated violations in the past two years, like multiple improper infection control violations, inadequate supply or improper use of PPE, COVID-19 non-compliance, resident neglect, call bells inaccessible, and facility staffing violations. Why were the families who are the watchdogs for their loved one's care locked out of the facilities to protect the residents from COVID exposure while at the same time KILA is introducing a continuous stream of COVID positive patients from hospitals why did the facility fail to notify the families? How many existing residents were exposed to COVID-19 and died from it? How many more non-COVID deaths need to be added to these horrifying COVID death counts? One question that haunts me is why are there so many COVID deaths? If the COVID positive patients were well enough to be discharged from the hospital, why are they dying at KILA? What kind of care are they providing to the COVID positive patients? Shouldn't they be healing then going home? For reasons like these, we did start the family council so that there could be better transparency with the facilities. But the death toll is still rising. The KILA nursing home has the highest numbers of COVID cases and deaths in all of the state of California. We do have those high statistics, but tonight I am honored to put some real names and real stories to two of those, of those who passed. First, let me tell you about Helen Kawagoe. Our country lost over 174,000 nursing home residents and staffs from COVID. We don't know how many more passed related to the loneliness, confinement, and unchecked quality of care. Helen passed away on April 6, 2020. She was a dedicated JACLer and served two terms as the JACL National President, three terms as the Gardena Valley Chapter President, Pacific Southwest District Governor, and honored as a JACL Living Legend. Uh, she was also the first woman of Japanese American descent elected to a local office serving 37 years as the city clerk for Carson. The city council chambers is now named in her honor. She truly led a distinguished and accomplished life. Please remember Helen Kawagoe. Now let me tell you about Jack's lucky life. 
Jack Nagano wrote in his own story about his life that he was so very lucky. That seems strange because he was born during the Spanish flu pandemic and grew up poor in Boyle Heights. He fought in World War II in the South Pacific against people who looked just like him. And because of that war, he was separated from his family for years. Not things most people would say is lucky, but that is not how he saw things. He felt lucky because he was healthy and excelled at athletics as a youth. Sports and church brought him to a community of Nisei that blossomed into friendships and introduced him to a love who would become his wife. The war that brought with it racism and conflict also brought camaraderie and a source of pride at being part of the military intelligence corps. And although stationed in the South Pacific, he wasn't killed. He felt lucky because he came back to a Japanese American community that was growing. His brother Paul became pastor of Evergreen Baptist Church and went on to create many other organizations that became important in the development of the Japanese American Christian community. Jack felt so lucky to be part of it. Jack and Louise were fortunate to have four children. They shared their valued community with each of them. And along with his friends, he started the CYC um, Japanese American Basketball League. Even in his last days, Jack felt lucky. The staff and community at KI loved him. He always had a smile and a joke for everyone at the facility. Even the kitchen staff looked forward to serving him when he came for his meals every day. He had that kind of effect. Jack felt lucky because he lived all of these moments gratefully and shared them with those he loved. Jack Nagano died of complications from COVID-19 on June 1st, 2020. He was 101 years old. He lived at KI for 10 years. Please remember Jack Nagano. Thank you.